Today we continue our study in the book of Romans, whose author is Paul, whose theme is the gospel of God that reveals the righteousness and the salvation of a holy God that must maintain his righteousness, but yet must save men who deserve to be punished. And we see his wonderful, glorious gospel. We're in Romans 9 through 11, and we're in chapter 11 today, and we've been looking at the gospel and God's sovereignty, that salvation is the result and the work and the achievement of the Lord, that we receive it and believe it and are responsible to do that, but salvation is a sovereign act by our Lord. And today we look and see the problem of unbelief in Israel and how God always keeps His promises to anybody and how that can be true if some of Israel uh, were not saved and, uh, have, and Israel nationally has been set aside that all the Gentiles might be saved today. And so we look at this 11th and final in this trio of three chapters today and I want to read the scripture today, but I want to go to our Heavenly Father first in prayer. Father, thank you that you can even override our blunders and our forgetting and our doing things wrong and saying things wrong. And so the worth and the value of our ministry is not us and our personalities or our earthly talents and abilities it is the act and the power and the purpose of you doing your work in our life and help us to understand that and though may we not try to do the work of the ministry sloppily may we not try to live the Christian life sloppily may we depend on you and understand that, that you're the part that really matters and Father, we pray that you will use this passage of Scripture today, that you will open up our understanding as we study it and look at it together. Lord, guide my thoughts and may the Spirit of God even place thoughts into other people's minds by the reading of Scripture and the instruction of Scripture that I may never think of or get to today. Direct and use your word today, we pray, and direct in the preaching of it and the teaching of it today. And we know that you're faithful to do that, and yet you've told us to pray, and so we ask you that, that we might be led by you and controlled by you and that we may depend on you today. For it's in our Savior's name that we ask these things. Amen. Say then, hath God cast away his people? God forbid. For I am an Israelite of the seed of Abraham, of the tribe of Benjamin. God hath not cast away his people whom he foreknew. Know ye not what the scripture saith of Elijah, how he maketh intercession to God against Israel, saying, Lord, they have killed thy prophets and dug down thine altars, and I am left alone, they seek my life. But what uh, saith the answer of God unto him? I have reserved to myself 7,000 men who have not bowed the knee to the image of Baal. Even so then, at this present time, there is also a remnant according to the election of grace. And if it be by grace, then it is no more of works. Otherwise, grace is no more grace. But it, if it be of works, then it is no more of grace. Otherwise, work is no more work. What then Israel hath not obtained that which he seeketh after? But a election hath obtained it, and the rest were blinded. According as it is written, God hath given them the spirit of slumber, eyes that they should not see, and ears that they should not hear to this day. And David saith, let their table be made a snare and a trap and a stumbling block and their recompense unto them. Let their eyes be darkened that they may not see and bow down their backs always. I say then, they have stumbled that 
they should fall, God forbid, but rather that through their fall, salvation has come to the Gentile to provoke them to jealousy. Now, if the fall of them be the riches of the world and the diminishing of them be the riches of the Gentile, how much more their fullness. For I speak to you Gentiles insomuch that I am the apostle to the Gentile. <clears throat> I magnify my office if by any means I prov uh, provoke to jealousy them who are of my flesh and might save some of them. If the casting away of them be the reconciling of the world, what shall the receiving of them be but life from the dead? For if the first fruits be holy, the lump also is holy, and if the root be holy, so are the branches. And if some of the branches be broken off, and thou, being a wild olive tree, were grafted in among them, and with them partakest the root and fatness of the olive tree, Boast not against the branches, but if thou boast, thou bearest not the root, but the root thee. Thou wilt say then, the branches were broken off, that I might be grafted in. Well, because of their unbelief were they broken off. And thou standest by faith, be not high-minded, but fear. For if God spared not the natural branches, take heed that he not spared thee. Behold, therefore, the goodness and the severity of God on them who fail severity, but towards thee goodness, if thou continue in his goodness. Otherwise, thou shalt be broken off. And they also, if they abide still in unbelief, shall uh, abide not still in unbelief, shall be grafted in, for God is able to graft them in again. For if thou wert cut off, <coughs> if thou wert cut out of the olive tree which is by wild by nature and were grafted contrary to nature into a good olive tree how much more shall these who were natural branches be grafted into their own olive tree for I would not have you to be ignorant brethren of this mystery lest you should be wise in your own conceit that blindness in part has happened to Israel until the fullness of the Gentiles become in and so shall all Israel be saved, as is written, There shall come out of Zion the deliverer, and shall turn away the ungodliness from Jacob. For this is my covenant unto them, and I will take away their sins. According to the Gospels, they, con concerning the Gospel, they are enemies for your sakes, but as touching election they are beloved uh, for the Father's sakes. For the calling and gift of God are without repentance. For as ye in times past have not believed God, yet now obtain mercy through their unbelief, even so these also now not believe that through your mercy they may obtain mercy. For God hath concluded them all in unbelief that he might have mercy upon all. Oh, the depths of the riches, both of the wisdom and the knowledge of God, how unsearchable are his judgments, and his ways are past finding out. For who hath known the mind of the Lord, or who hath been his counselor, or who hath first given unto him, and it shall be recompensed unto him again, for of him and through him and to him are all things to whom be glory forever. Amen. God is not a man, and I'm glad that he's not. Now, we were made in the image of God, so in some ways we should resemble and can have the characteristics that God has. But God is holy and complete and perfect and just, and His Word is always true. And when God makes a promise, you can count on it. Everything else may crumble and change, but God, and his character and his word and his promises do not change. Now we understand you that are parents and all of us wish that we had kept more of our promises that we had made in life. And we need to, to do that. We need to try to as much as possible in these old natures of uh, having this nature of sin along with our godly nature, we need to try to keep our word. It's very important. 
the, the integrity of our life. And if you don't have integrity, you don't have much else. If, if you don't have the integrity to try to keep your promises. And we ought, we ought to make an attempt if we promise our children or if we promise someone that we will do it. But a man's word's not what it used to be 50 years ago. Because we have gotten so far from God and the, the, the life of God has gone so far out of our lives, promises in a lot of times in a lot of people just aren't worth anything anymore. People tell you they're going to do things for you and with you and promise you, but they don't necessarily do that. And our children always notice that, by the way. Isn't it amazing how children always remember you, what you promised them? Or you tell them something, and two years later, when you don't do it, or they call that promise into collection then, they remind you how you said you would do that thing. And if our children do that to us, we ought to be remembering and concerned and depending on because God is not like us who sometimes don't and forget to keep our promises. God always keeps his promise. But of course he decides the time of the fulfillment of that promise, not us. But he will always do what he said. And so we see this in this sovereign uh, chapter as God discusses Israel and the Gentiles and the restoration of Israel and how that those that are saved in Israel are a, uh, a remnant that demonstrates his sovereign choices in salvation uh, by grace. And so we see the chapter today. And so we must. And people err in this book dispensationally because they do not realize that God will keep his promise to the Old Testament saints. And he will keep his word and his promise to Israel. And so we say, well, that must be fulfilled in some other way. That, that's applied to us in the church age now since we're spiritual Israel. And that God didn't mean he was going to do that for them. He meant that he was going to give that to us, which is the transition that proceeded from the Old Testament. Well, it is true that, that God blesses us through that transition, but the promises that he made to the Old Testament about a literal millennial and reigning as king over them and blessing the whole earth must come true, friend, for Israel because God promised it to. And we don't spiritually apply it, and that's where we get into trouble, and that's where men miss the truth of the Scripture when they really don't count on God's Word being true exactly like he gave it in its literal sense. And the promises of God are true. Praise God they are. And so today we say, see God keep his promises to Israel and how? How does he do that? Well, in verses 1 through 6, we see that Israel has a spiritual remnant now. Of course, now they can be part of the church. And now they believe and become part of the church and one with the Gentile and they spiritually can be saved now. But the Old Testament promises to Israel, God is going to keep that because he is reserved in his will and in his time to preserve a faithful believing remnant out of the physical descendants of Abraham and nationally that remnant will be saved and personally they will be saved in the future after God has finished dealing with the church in this age. God has reserved a, a group, a number of people and that he knows that will be born in Israel in that time and they will be saved. And Paul discusses that here. And he says, Elijah said, I'm by myself. And the Lord says, no, you're not. I've got 7,000 Israelites who have never corrupted their faith by receiving and bowing and worshiping Baal. And God always, at any time, in any group, uh, out of the masses of humanity, preserves and keeps a really saved group of people at any time. And it is always so. And it is produced by the sovereignty of his choice and the election of his grace. And we see that Paul says that that's possible and that has occurred because of the election of his grace. God 
determined it and chose it, and he has and will always keep his promises and bring them to pass by his sovereignty because he's God. He's able and he's willing to do that, and he always does that. And so we see his sovereignty that right now, reserved into Israel nationally, there is a remnant. There are a people marked out and reserved. And people are being saved in the church age, but there is this preserved remnant that will be called in the future that will constitute national Israel in the tribulational period. God makes sovereign choices and provides salvation and saves who He will and the rest are left in their blindness and in their unbelief rejecting the salvation of God. God keeps His promises. God is sovereign. God has a remnant. And we see God's sovereign purposes in 7 through 25. We see Israel nationally blinded and set apart aside. God let Israel take the course. Now, it was Israel's fault that they took it. Israel, in their misunderstanding, in their unbelief, in their desire to reject God's personal salvation, and because they would not have God or believe His Word or have faith that, that God would uh, produce in them and they would not go by the revelation, they turned everyone to their own way and established their own righteousness nationally. They missed as a nation the promise of their Messiah when he came. And God let them do that and he purposed that they would do that that the gospel might be opened up to the whole world. Israel and God's sovereignty was nationally blinded and set aside. And Paul said that uh, here you have the olive tree which represents God and his work in Israel. And the, the root was there, and the tree was there, but some of the branches, national Israel, were broken off. And wild Gentile branches were grafted in. And so God opened up the, the salvation to all the world in the church age. And Gentiles were saved and predominate in this age. But he cautions and says that because of unbelief, because of the, they rejected their Messiah when they could have received him, as Christ offered the kingdom. And they would not respond by faith, instead responded by self-righteousness to the law. And they would not confess their sin and seek personal righteousness, but believe that they were all right because they were Jews and religious. Because of that, their unbelief, they were broken off. And because of the unbelief of the Gentile, and this passage warns about that, that we were grafted in by God's mercy and sovereignty and God's grace, and if we uh, turn in unbelief, which will occur at the end of, end of the church age, that the, the uh, world will become so immersed in unbelief that the false church will go into the tribulation and the true church will be raptured, but the Christendom as a whole is characterized right now by unbelief. It, uh, everybody that says that they know God is not certainly basing their faith upon this book. And so when, when the sin of the Gentile history of the world is immersed in complete unbelief and God gets ready to judge it, he will stop dealing with the Gentile and start again dealing with the Jew. And he says if the setting aside of Israel and the, the opening up of the gospel to the whole world is glorious and merciful and it is and wonderful. What will be the restoring of Israel but blessedness and, and life from the dead? And God has concluded all in unbelief and the whole world uh, uh, in unbelief that he might have mercy on whom he will at any time and in any age. And we see God's sovereignty and we see God's mercy and we see the greatness and the scope of it that God is no respecter of person and even though he's just and holy and it is on the basis of unbelief that he does these things, it is still in his sovereign plan and with his sovereign salvation and his sovereign choices that he makes these decisions. And we see that in Israel being broken off and the Gentiles grafted in and one day the Gentiles broken off and Israel put back in and God 
dealing with the world through them in the tribulational period and in the millennial setup again. And so we see God's sovereignty in verses 7 through 25. And then we, we see Israel's future national salvation in 26 through 36. And God's promises are unchangeable. Look at verse 29. God's gifts and, and promises and his, his callings. For the gifts of call and callings of God are without repentance. That means they're without change. That means God doesn't take them back again. Because Israel's sin and in unbelief didn't mean God said, well, I can't keep my promises to you anymore because you're, you're sinful and in unbelief. And friend, the Christian gifts that God gives you and the abilities to serve Him and the callings of, of your life, if you reject those or if you're not faithful in those and if you don't use those for Him, uh, he's not going to uh, say, well, you don't have to be accountable to me anymore for them. Or he's not going to necessarily take them away from you. Though your, your usefulness in those things will be diminished until you renew and, and refresh your life in God. But God doesn't change his mind about his promises and his calling and his gifts. And that's what the scripture indicates here. That when he gives them and when he promises them and when he says this is what I want you to do, he doesn't change his mind about that if that's a gift and a calling and a promise that he's made to us. And so we understand that, that God's promises are unchangeable. Now we need to understand what God has promised and if it's conditional. And we need to understand the time of the promise. And sometimes... And Spurgeon said that we ought to apply the scripture in its widest possible context. And uh, if it was a promise made to Christians generally, we ought to claim it for ourselves. And we apply truth to ourselves. But certain things were promised to Israel that is not promised to the church. And certain things were promised to the church that's not promised to Israel. And certain offers were made to Israel in the kingdom that are not being made now. And so you need to understand the context of God's word and the limit and the timing of the promise and the extent of the promise. If you understand, though, what God has said, then you can count on the promise. And then we see the coming king, the deliverer, in 26, the, uh, out of Zion, who is the Lord Jesus Christ. And one day he's nationally going to turn Israel from their sin and he's going to reign as their king and they're going to believe him and receive him that believing remnant whom they pierced in the uh, 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 tribulational period, national Israel is going to look up and see their coming king and believe in him and realize he was their Messiah. And, and God says, look at the wisdom and plan and mercy and greatness of our God. He set Israel aside because of their unbelief, that he might save the whole world. And then it, when the whole world is, is, is wrapped in unbelief, he's going to graft Israel back in and again work through them. Oh, the riches and the depths of the knowledge and the decisions of God. They are so marvelous and deep And who has been his counselor and who has been his instructor. Who can... Uh, trace his past and track him down and understand God and all about his thinking and what he knows and does. None of us can. Our God is marvelous and sovereign and wonderful and mighty and so far above us, so that Paul says, of him and through him and in him we live and move and have our being to him, to our sovereign God whose wisdom and knowledge and working is so wonderful. And so marvelous, his plan is so great and so fair and so just. He's more than just. His mercy is like the waters in the oceans of the sea. His mercy and his grace. Our God is so great. Rest in his sovereign ability to do what he said he would do. And believe and fear and realize that our hope and our standing and our salvation comes because we believe and trust in what 
his promises, what his word is saying. See God keep his promises. See God save and dispense his salvation sovereignty. Let see the need of faith. Learn from the word of God today, I pray. Amen.